So now, welcome to all of you to the webinar on Doklam 2.0. I won't tell you what Doklam 2.0 is right now, but what I want to tell you is that we are going to say, give you the evidence. And primarily, thereafter focus on what is the logic of that evidence. So you have, it is in three parts. And the first part is, of course, we give you a historical background to Doklam itself, where it is located, what is it, how does it matter, and what is it between Bhutan, India, and China about Doklam. And the historian here is Takshishila's own budding historian, Anirudh Kaniseti. So he'll Thank take you. the first part of that histor historical basis. And I will then take you through the evidence, first through Doklam 1, and then to Doklam 2.0, and then tell, and then sort of give you uh, Takshishila's view of the implications and options. So with that, I hand you over to the historian, Anurudh V. Kaniseti. Thank you, General. Uh, thank you so much for the warm inter introduction and uh, welcome, guys. Um, very excited to be here and I'm hoping that we're going to have a wonderful discussion on this fascinating issue over the next hour and a half. Um, so let's begin uh, with a very interesting period in history, the 18th century. Uh, now, I'm sure that when it comes to the Himalayas, we generally associate the Himalayas with uh, peacefulness and monasteries and maybe monks chanting in a lonely valley. Uh, but let me tell you that the 18th century is pretty much the exact opposite of this image that we have of the Himalayas. Um, and the reason for that is that because in the 18th century is when gunpowder really enters the Himalayas in a major way. So the 18th century is when the Qing dynasty of China is beginning to aggressively expand into Central Asia. It's pushing away uh, the Central Asian tribes. Uh, and roughly at the same time, Tibet is a very, very important geopolitical and also cultural center. Uh, I know it's a little hard for us to identify Tibet with such importance today uh, because it's more or less been occupied by China today, but Tibet actually used to be uh, an, a major economic, cultural and religious center for um, a lot of countries, especially around the Himalayan region. Um, so Tibet wasn't always under the rule of the Dalai Lamas as it is today. Uh, it was perpetually a source of um, a major conflict between nobles and spiritual leaders, the Lamas. And the Dalai Lama was just one among many, many conflicting rival Ramas uh, whose authority was not really very well established. And the only reason why the Dalai Lama particularly was considered to be very important was because he was considered to be the primary political intermediary between the Chinese emperor and the Mongol tribes that lived in Central Asia. Uh, and of course, uh, I think all of us are familiar with the Mongols in the sense that they are uh, hardly very civilized and peaceful conquerors. And the Mongols of the 18th century were no exception. Uh, they were deeply involved in the political affairs of Tibet, uh, constantly siding with one noble or the other uh, against the Tibetans, against against the Dalai Lama or against the Chinese as the need, uh, as the political expedient was at the time. So over the 1720s to 1750s, what we see is a lot of political conflict uh, with the Dalai Lama perpetually appealing to the Chinese to come in and save him uh, from the attacks of the dastardly Mongols and the attacks of the nobles that wanted to overthrow him. So simultaneously in this period, along with all the conflict that we're seeing in Tibet between the Dalai Lama, the Chinese and the Mongols and the nobles, you have state formation happening in Nepal, Sikkim and Bhutan. So if you recall the note that I began on uh, about Tibet being a spiritual and cultural center, it's very interesting to note that the kingdoms of Sikkim and Bhutan, which formed barely a hundred years before all this happened, both claimed to be founded either by a Lama who came from Tibet or from a family that was descended from a Lama that came from Tibet, which is quite an interesting thing. Um, now, Nepal is a bit of an exception because rather than taking its spiritual authority from Tibetan Buddhism, it took its authority from Brahmanical Hinduism. And the Kingdom of Nepal was historically a lot more aggressive towards its Himalayan neighbors than, say, Sikkim and Bhutan, though I should probably note that Sikkim and Bhutan were no real paragons of peace themselves. Uh, so Nepal, Sikkim, Bhutan, and Tibet were more or less in a state of extreme political churn, constantly fighting over 
who controlled what trade routes, um, whose authority was more important in one particular area. And we have to keep in mind that this is a time before barbed wire, right? So you don't really have clearly demarcated national boundaries. Uh, the boundaries between a kingdom were generally uh, what was accepted to be a, a, an important pass, for example, or an important river, right? So with that in mind, uh, let's move a little forward to the 1790s when the Dalai Lama's political authority has more or less been established thanks to Chinese intervention. And it was roughly at this time that the Nepalese had the brilliant idea of invading Tibet over some kind of trade dispute. And the Tibetans, which is to say the Dalai Lama, immediately appealed to the Chinese for help. The Chinese sent quite a large army. They were unable to really defeat the Nepalese in a conclusive way, but uh, managed to push them back into Nepal and established a protectorate in Tibet. Now, what that means is that the Chinese would send a garrison that was usually stationed in Tibet and also a sort of military governor who would overlook and ratify the decisions of the Dalai Lamas. All right. Um, and I think a good example uh, that shows how much influence the Chinese had in Tibet at this time is uh, this beautiful tapestry that I put in here on the right, which uh, is the Qianglong Emperor, one of China's most famous rulers, uh, depicted as the Bodhisattva Manjusri. And this is a Tibetan Thangka from the time. Now, uh, as we all know, in the 19th century, uh, China went through its own troubles, right? So uh, they had the Taiping Rebellion, which was one of the most destructive conflicts of the early modern period. Uh, they had the Opium Wars, where they were humiliated by a series of Western powers. Uh, and their authority over Tibet became substantially less than what it had been during the time of the, Qi of the Qianlong Emperor. Now, in 1890, you have some, a new dynamic being introduced into the Himalayas, and that is the British, right? So the British have managed to, at this point, more or less secure their control over most of India, and they're extremely interested, as they always were, in trade. And the trade that they were interested in in the Himalayas was, of course, trade coming through Tibet and into Cal Kolkata. So according to the British, the best way to secure that was A, to reach an agreement with the Chinese, and B, to make sure that Bhutan was set up as a buffer state between them and the Chinese. So in return for, for um, them accepting Tibet as an official Chinese protectorate, the Chinese allowed the British to more or less make Bhutan into a protected state. So in 1910, what you see is the British signing the Treaty of Punaka, by which Bhutan becomes essentially a protected state of the British. Now, essentially, just think about what it means on the ground. On the ground, it means that um, the British have secured trade routes going into Tibet, and the Chinese have more or less been bro beaten into this agreement because, um, as we've seen, they didn't really have serious consolidated authority over Tibet thanks to their own political and, and uh, civil war problems. But the British uh, essentially convinced them to agree to this because the British had the upper, the, the, the upper hand in Asia as they do. So uh, let's move on to uh, actually discuss what the contours of the agreement between the British and the Chinese were. And to do that, we need to look a little bit at the geography of, of, this, of the area that we now know as Dokla, right? So if you look at the trijunction here, what you see is China, India, and Bhutan. The border between India and China is orange, between China and Bhutan is red, and between India and Bhutan is blue. Uh, so the particular geographic features that you should be looking at are Batangla, Mount Kaimochen, Merugla, and Senchela. All right? um, and also observe the Tista River, which you'll see on your left, and the Mochu River, which you see on your right. So according to the agreement that the British made with the Chinese, the boundary of Sikkim and Tibet shall be the crest of the mountain range separating the waters of the Tista and, if, and its affluents from the waters flowing into the Tibetan Mochu and northwards into other rivers of Tibet. All right. So this is legally. So let me just simplify that for you. What the treaty is saying is, if you look at the Tisa River, which as you can see is on your left, and the Mochu River, which is on your right, the boundary between India and China is the highest mountain range separating these two river systems. All right. So this is what is called the watershed principle. Now to continue with the treaty, the line commences at Mount Jipmochi on the Bhutan frontier and follows the above mentioned water parting to the point where it meets Nepal territory. All right. So let's get into this a little bit. What exactly does this particular line mean? Um, 
the line commences at Mount Jipmochi. So the watershed, according to the treaty, begins at Mount at a certain mountain called Jipmochi, which I've marked here as Gaimochen, and continues along the crest of the mountains to the point where it meets Nepalese territory. The reason why this treaty is important is because it's signed between the British and the Chinese, right? So the Chinese are supposedly agreeing on behalf of Tibet, and the British are supposedly agreeing on behalf of Sikkim. But unfortunately, Bhutan is not mentioned in the treaty even once. Nepal is part of the treaty, but Bhutan is not. So Bhutan has not actually uh, been mentioned in this treaty at all. And as you recall, even though it has become a protected state of the British in 1910, Bhutan never ratified this treaty that was made between the British and the Chinese. And the reason why that is a problem, we'll get into in the next slide. Right? So since you established that the principle to be used for agreeing the boundary between Sikkim and Tibet is the watershed principle. Let's try to figure out where exactly this watershed is. Okay, so according to India today, this here is the watershed, right? So the watershed should be the peak of the highest mountain of this crest, which in our case seems to be the mountain Merugla, right? Which is fifteen thousand feet high. So according to us, the watershed is what you can see the red line here. So it's following the crest of the mountains, it's going through Batangla, Merugla, Senchela, and then back up along the Mochu River. Now, this is where the point of contention with the Chinese lies. The Chinese claim that this is the watershed. And why do they say that? Because as you recall, the treaty says that the line be begins at Mount Jipmochi. Um, so Jipmochi is Gaimochen here, as you can see, is 14,000 feet high. If you are to stick to the actual interpretation of the watershed principle, Merugla is the is the crest of the range, and that's where the border should be. But according to the Chinese, since the treaty very conveniently says Gamochen, Gamochen is where the watershed should be. Now I'll tell you why this is a problem, and uh, that is that at the time when the treaty was made, a complete cartographic survey of the area had not been completed. So to the best of the geographical knowledge at that time, Gamochen was indeed the highest crest. But now with more advanced surveying equipment, we know that Merugla is the highest point. And considering that the Chinese and Indian sites have agreed on multiple occasions that the watershed principle applies, we should actually be using Merugla as, the, as a trijunction, right? And so this is the fundamental point that has led to all the conflict that we are seeing today in Lokala. So why is it that India especially so concerned about uh, China getting into this particular area? After all, I mean, it's, it's just a few mountains, right? So this here is why it's important. So the view that you can see here is from north to south. So this is, uh, if, you, if you imagine that you're standing on top of Merugla and looking down south onto North India, right? So you can immediately see that the Shiligudi corridor is extremely vulnerable from this point. The Chinese, if they had control over this particular bit of territory, would be able to see precisely what is happening in the Shiliguri corridor, what troop movements are happening, for example. And in the extremely unlikely event that an actual armed conflict happens, it will be very easy for them to seize this part of, of India's territory and cut us off essentially from the Northeast. But we'll get to that in a little while. So let's briefly talk about how exactly it is that China ended up in the Dokala region region in the first place. And to do that, we need to understand exactly what Bhutan and China's relationship has been over time. So we've, if, if you recall our historical discussion, we've, brought, we've come up to the point of roughly 1910, when Bhutan agreed to essentially become a protected state of Britain. And in 1947, when India gained its independence, Bhutan was quite happy to essentially continue this friendly relationship that it had established with India. But unfortunately, in 1959, something happened that kind of shook Bhutan's confidence in India. And that was China's occupation of Tibet. So if you recall the discussion that we had about how China actually ended up in Tibet, you understand that China didn't actually have a very strong reason to rule Tibet outright. They had some influence over it, sure. The British agreed their influence over it, sure. But that didn't really give them a right to invade it as they did. Now, when they invaded Tibet, uh, one of the Chinese ambassadors there actually made an extremely provocative statement where he said that Nepalese, Bhutanese, and Sikkimese had been subjects of Tibet and of the great motherland of China 
and that they must what must once more be reunited and taught the communist doctrine so uh, i'm sure you can understand the effect that this had on the bhutanese right so there are tiny state uh, sandwiched between india and between china and china is essentially implying that they want to invade and occupy bhutan the same way they occupied tibet uh, and then in 1960 when a huge number of tibetan refugees began to flee tibet and come into india the route they took was through bhutan which again was something that was highly disturbing to the bhutanese um, and which actually led to them closing their border with china so things are all fine for the bhutanese now they seem i mean they've more or less cut off contact with china completely they are hoping that india is going to support them and then in 1962 the sino indian war happens and bhutan's confidence in india's ability to protect them is once again shaken um so when in 1971 bhutan eventually got united nations membership they almost immediately began to start talking with china and tried to normalize relationships tried to normalize their relationship with them and from 1984 onwards china and bhutan began to have annual talks and the primary um, objective of the talks from the very beginning was to try and sort out the border issues that they both had so in 1990 china comes down to bhutan and they make them an offer which i call the proposed exchange right so what exactly is this proposed exchange essentially china offered to exchange 495 square kilometers uh, jakarlong and pasarlong which you will see in the top right hand corner they offered to give that to bhutan in exchange for bhutan giving them sinchulong and shakato which you will see on the left side of the map so why exactly would china offer such a deal to the bhutanese and the answer lies in the strategic importance of sinchulong and shakato if you look at them they are extremely close to paro which you'll see marked with 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 a little airplane icon there and it's on bhutan's only functioning airfield assuming that hostilities were to break out it would be extremely easy for the chinese from shakato and sinchulong to seize paro and from there move to hunchuling and move down into india's territory so it's extremely strategically important for them to seize control and maintain control of this territory whereas jakarlong and pasarlong simply do not have the same kind of strategic importance um, now the now for bhutan uh, in principle that's a pretty good deal right because at least the popular perception in bhutan is that shakato and sinchulong are essentially places that have little value beyond uh, grazing and jakarlong and pasarlong are much larger territories as is quite evident from the map So even the Bhutan seemed to agree in principle in '95. There was no further progress on these talks. Now, as to why there was no further progress, we can only speculate. But it's quite possible that India managed to prevail upon Bhutan that this would not be in India's strategic interests. So in 1998, China affirmed its re- respect for Bhutan's sovereignty and integrity. But nevertheless, we see that from 2000 onwards, in Bhutan's National Assembly, the king himself. comes out and admits that the chinese have constantly been intruding into bhutanese territory building roads there and despite multiple protests raised in the national assembly uh, both the government and china ignored them in 2002 the chinese claimed that they had documentary evidence that they deserve to control the dokala territory and even the bhutan requested them to be generous since they were a small neighbor china refused saying that they had 11 major neighbors and they could not afford to be generous with even one of them uh, so we see this sort of um, re- relationship being established between bhutan and china where the chinese are essentially badgering the bhutanese to give up strategically vital territory and whether or not the bhutanese actually do that voluntarily the chinese essentially go in and occupy it themselves so in 2009 bhutan essentially agreed to the status quo and they ceded this mountain called kula kangri which you will see in the map in the in the top right and since then uh, china has seized considerable territory through continuous road and camp building and according to dr govinda rizal who is a bhutanese living and currently based in japan china has over the years seized over 8000 square kilometers of bhutanese territory which is extremely disturbing So I'm going to pause at this moment for any questions. If you guys might have, just uh, raise your hands. I'll unmute you, and we can quickly discuss them. We have about ten um, minutes. I can take any questions you have in, in that time. So just raise your hands, and I'll unmute you. I see. Yeah, Aishwarya, Aish, I see you have a question. Uh, Go ahead. 
Can you speak a little louder, yeah. please? Uh, I can. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, could you uh, uh, dial back to the uh, slide where we were looking at uh, North India from uh, the top? Yeah. Yeah. Here. So, uh, what I just so this basically uh, establishes why Dokala and or Doklam is uh, strategically important and why all this brouhaha. Uh, as it exposes the Siliguri corridor, what I wanted to understand was that doesn't so we are saying that uh, so, uh, you know don't uh, Mount Aimachen and Merugla open up the Siliguri corridor to the same kind of uh, uh, you know uh, 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 vulnerability from China, like at, at least from where I am looking at it. It seems like it's 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 a little further away, but Merugla and Mount Gaimachen both offer the same kind of vulnerability to Siliguri corridor. Isn't that right? Okay, I'll take that on. Uh, uh, well, it's like this. Uh, okay, sure. Go ahead. The tri junction point, which is in which which is in contention, is not Merugla. It is Batangla, which is on your right side. Okay, that's where okay. the tri junction with Bhutan and India says should be between. Bhutan, India, and China. Whereas China says that the tri-junction should be at Mount Gyamochen, according to the Treaty of 1890, which mentions Jipmochi, and apparently that is because of a cartographic misinterpretation. Okay. Uh, the point is, at the moment, India has there physically on Gyamochen and at Batangla. Uh, so if we exceed to what the Chinese say, and the Bhutanese also agree to that, then they will be at Mount Gyamochen, which, as you can see, gives you a fairly good observation of the Siliguri Corridor. But okay. the point which Anurudh made, which is, in actual fact, this is where the Chumbi Valley starts and goes northwards, okay? And it's been a, a trade route for centuries. Okay. But if, if, if China wants to actually, because here they've got this what, um, uh, feature which is called the Jam Ferry Ridge, which is in Bhutan, it's a formidable feature. Uh, and we are, they've got, we've got the Dokala Ridge on the right side. So it's difficult for them to really, I mean, they can, but uh, they'll have to first take care of these differences before they can get to the Siliguri Corridor. Oh. It's much more easier for them geographically to get to, to Siliguri Corridor via Paro. And that is why they wanted that exchange, is what we surmise. Got Otherwise, it. why would the Chinese look at that particular territory and say, why don't you give this to us, exchange it for what is there in the north? And apparently, that's what we think that the strategic reasons of the Chinese are. So the Siliguri Corridor being the, uh, you can say, the narrow neck to the northeast. And of course, we are now building alternatives. Hmm. It's, it will become, if, if Mount Gamochen becomes the tri-junction, and that's where we come into the dispute between Bhutan, China, and China, is because that affects us. Then Chinese become our neighbors okay. instead, of Bhutan, instead of Bhutan, and it becomes a strategic vulnerability for us. Okay. It, okay. It, therefore, it is, it is to uh, avoid that, that we say that it is strategically important. Okay. I hope I answered the question. Yes, yes. Also, uh, uh, is is there an update on the status of the proposed exchange to which Bhutan had uh, in principle agreed or does it just lie in limbo? Well, uh, there is no progress and he said that. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, apparently, India would have applied some sort of uh, diplomatically told them that this is not in our interest and therefore Bhutan is held back. Because oh, in Bhutan's yes. view, they are not quite interested really in this area. They don't think that it's important mm -hmm. to them. It is, but it's of concern to us. It changes our neighbors. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Ash. So, uh, any other questions, guys? I see Neil has a question. Uh, one second. Go ahead, um, Neil. So, uh, yeah, in continuation to what was just said, I would just like to know that. Uh, we are talking about uh, observation. Firstly, as far as observation is concerned. Um, in today's time and age and with the assets which are uh, available with China, do you think that land-based observation really makes a difference, one? 
and two if we look at it as uh, purely as you know uh, chinese rolling down sort of thing given the terrain the terrain imperative and the imperatives as far as lines of communication is concerned how realistic is it that you know people will really roll down and we won't be able to do anything about it neil the point is like this physical yeah. observation and technical observation go together if yes. you have both then it's better if you have only one then you are disadvantaged because somebody can block that okay that's how it works so so let's say that in your in your search one cannot be replaced by the other in strategic terms it is not something which you can actually give and take on that account so that's point one the how difficult it is for the chinese is it's going to be difficult for the chinese there's no doubt for them to actually do what they what they want to do if they want to come across it will be difficult and therefore it's not about the difficulty it's about the chinese gaining a strategic pressure point which they can utilize when they require it you will give it to them if you get them to sit on mount gamochen it will become a pressure point and that's what they do so as i i would agree with you that if you want to cut off the siliguri corridor they can come via paro and the bhutanese really wouldn't be able to stop them it's much easier because let me tell you one thing that actually uh, there are, there is a photograph which is there in the indian military training team in bhutan which actually is taken of i think k king 3 who had physically moved from paro come into dokala went across uh, come into the dokala area went across then went to darjeeling and so on and the photograph is taken there of course he moved in coincident because those days the chinese and all were not there so over a period of time the chinese presence here has increased and now we are where we are so that's how it is right okay all right uh, thanks sir uh, neil so do we have any more questions or shall we continue with the next part of our lecture please raise your hands and i'll unmute you all right perfect Uh, general so i'm just going to stop sharing or oh, so i see deepankar has a question um, okay one second go ahead go ahead yeah. very basic question uh, do india have military presence in bhutan ah uh, well it's like this we have a military training team which trains the bhutanese army uh, we actually equip them and that training team has been there for quite some time we don't have a military presence in bhutan except that we do exercises with the bhutanese joint exercises with the bhutanese which is part of a normal or uh, you can say joint operations capability preparation but otherwise we do not have we have also in in this thing uh, a bro which is a border roads this thing and most of the roads in bhutan actually are built by the border road so we don't have a physical presence all the time okay Okay. Um, I think we have time for Pranav, one Pranav. more really quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Pranav. Go ahead, Pranav. Um, the Chinese have actually rejected uh, some of the some of the parts of the treaty. They said that the treaty is illegitimate because it was made before the PRC came. The PRC is now currently the legitimate one, and they haven't acknowledged the treaty. Um, isn't that also true? Because they're moving in. <laughs> no not at all because uh, as soon as doklam 1.0 broke out and i think general man will get into it in greater detail the chinese immediately took out took out the 1890 convention and said hey look the convention says uh, mount jipochi so why why on earth is india here it's our territory so yeah oh. china is, is very selective about when it chooses to apply these treaties and when it chooses to say no it's typical double speak you're right the china has consistently stated that what agreement took place between the britishers and the and and uh, china china is not a valid one and in this case they quote a treaty which is precisely that so this they brought it out actually the first time uh, so there is scope in fact what this this says because that treaty is fundamentally based on the watershed principle yes so if you were to actually try and seek an agreement with the chinese and if the chinese were actually going to say that okay let's get to the watershed then maybe there is scope for some sort of an agreement but geopolitically i would say the china would not be interested in it because 
other re because of geopolitical reason at this point in time they would like yeah. to keep the northern border as a pressure point and because some of the because some of the chinese scholars when doklam one took place some of the chinese scholars were writing that uh, a fresh start could be made by making a more comprehensive treaty yeah they did in, in the sense that there is there is in fact some of our indian scholars had said so and yes. they said that if we do that we might have to um, compromise the side chain and we might get probably make the make the uh, uh, what do you call the watershed principle as the line in which we sort out with the others so that's that's a possibility i mean it's a historic I mean, okay only time will tell but the watershed principle is not what the chinese have accepted so far uh, thank you gentlemen thank you anirudh thanks pranam all right gentlemen so um, ram uh, i see i have a question now we're running a little no, short no, on let time him, let him to speak yeah okay. sorry all right sure. go ahead thanks general thanks anirudh uh, a basic question uh, is there any indian name for the region because we're seeing doklam dokala and we know that the chinese are notorious for this cartographic aggression and the idea of renaming certain places so is there any kind of system for nomenclature of all these areas so as far as india is concerned and uh, we have no doubt at all that it is bhutanese territory so india's primary concern there is who exactly is our neighbor is it going to be a hostile power or is it going to be a historically friendly power so uh, from our perspective we've been happy to accept the bhutanese nomenclature for it uh, we've been happy to accept bhutan's idea of where the border is it's only china that comes in and as you'll see later when we show you a map of, of what china has put out um, you'll see that china has its own names for the territory we have been talking about doklam primarily and so you know it's because that's how it is the doklam plateau is what has been referred to by us by the indians thank you sir but the chinese have a different name we'll come to that yes neil is you are you still asking a question your hand is up or you can you just put it down we can call it dk puram <laughs> when you have it now you don't have it okay uh that's the problem so thanks, let's thanks for the input nitin uh, right. <laughs> okay so uh so i'll just uh, stop sharing my screen sir and then you can share yours yeah okay uh i hope everybody can see my screen now i'm going to just tell you uh give you a brief so i mean it, it's a recapitulation of what has happened and what we call takshila calls doklam 1.0 well it all began uh, in the area which we are talking about which is the dokla just ahead of the dokla post and it's just about 100 meters or 200 meters down slope is the dok where the it's, it's a flattish area called the doklam plateau and uh, they have always been for over a period of time for the, let's say since the 1990s 2000s early 2000s the tracks have always been there the chinese have been coming and going they normally go uh, lately they've been coming in jeeps but there are you know these are kacha roads so they come dismount they probably go up to the torsa nala and go back but then they, it was uh, even the patrols had a large va variation in time difference when they came and so also would the bhutanese go down and come back and that's what it was so on 16th of june last year china began road construction in this territory now this is territory is what is disputed between bhutan and china and that is because of the fact that they have a different opinion on where the tri junction is according to them it is in batangla according to bhutan it is in uh, according to them it's in gyamochen according to bhutan it's in batangla so that's the area where actually this dispute is so on the 18th of june indian troops from the dokala post physically went down took two dozers down and blocked the road construction activity of the chinese and that's where the standoff started so that standoff continued we had the uh, uh, the chinese also built in some sort of an administrative thing in their rear for us it was easy because we have a road up to dokala and we just had to take it across the fact that we took the two dozers down and you must have seen the pictures with the chinese had put out where the dozers were seen on the slopes of dokala so why did the indians do it and they said that they were doing it on behalf of bhutan 
and because this is disputed territory, China is using force against a smaller neighbor. And we have a treaty. We didn't quote the treaty, but we have a, a treaty with them, which has been redesigned, and which says that we will, in case of, we will keep each other's national interests in mind. It's called Article Two of that treaty. You can look it up. So this is the logic which we said, and and the basic thing was that this area is important to us. It makes us more vulnerable, so we can't allow the Chinese to be there. I mean, this is the the this thing which we took. That was the official line. And that's why we said we are in twin on behalf of Bhutan. Well, the intervention took place on 18 June, but it was quiet till 26, 27 June when China went public and started its vitriolic statements accusing India of being an aggressor and so on. And it continued till, frankly, the, uh, it got de-escalated on 28th of August. So on 29th of June, Bhutan raised an official complaint with China, disputing China's claim that it is not a disputed territory. And they should therefore go back to the status quo, which was there already there. And on 26th of July, China releases an official sketch map. Now remember, this is done one month before the de-escalation, which was done with a face-saving compromise. So just let's look at the map. Can you see a small arrow at the bottom left-hand corner? Yeah. Yeah, so there's one of the... There's one on the right, yeah, click on that. Okay, got it. So just look at this map. Uh, the darkened portion in red is what the Chinese said in that map, said is part of their territory. So if you follow my arrow, this is Batangla. So according to the Chinese, this, watch my arrow, is what it is and goes just below the Jamferi Ridge. This is a formidable ridge here. It goes below the Jamferi Ridge, then turns east and goes off northwards. This is what the Chinese map claimed. Whereas in the 1890 agreement, and that's where the, where the difference of opinion is, we, we say, and Bhutan says, Batangla is the point where it should be, and this is how the boundary should be what I'm indicating on the arrow. So this area is what the Chinese have cartographically claimed by the release of that map. And the area where, follow my arrow, where it's in red circle, is where we had the standoff, which is just east of Dokala, on the Dokala Plateau itself. So this is the map. And, and we have given you the Chinese version, which is on the, the right side, and the translation on the left. And this is the map which I have transposed on the ground. And so the Chinese are now claiming, and this was, frankly, uh, the Chinese had not made such a claim before, but this official map done on 26 January gives you an indication of what the Chinese are saying is their territory. So this is what it is. And this is the Amochu River here on the right. This is the Tosa Nala, which goes, and this is Dokala. So the Tosa Nala is a Nala actually which is, it's deep. It cannot be crossed easily by, on foot. It will require some bridging because it's very deep. So this is where, this is what the Chinese claim has been. Now, what was, the what was our reaction? As I said before, we justified it on our security concerns and the fact that the Chinese and Indians had an understanding that we will resolve the tri-junction through talks. 
So this was actually using force to already undermine that understanding because this meant that the Chinese have unilaterally uh, imposing the fact that Jiamo Chin is the tri-junction. And that's what India's case was. But what do we do? But there was great official restraint. We were calm, composed, as far as our reactions were concerned. But of course, the Indian media had, was very active and there was considerable media coverage about it. But at the same time, there were apparently intensive official engagements to resolve the crisis. Now, intensive because there was an event coming up, which was the BRICS meeting in Beijing. And that was scheduled in the first week of September. So, India also did not, in military terms, just took out normal localized precautions like they had done. But what did the Chinese do? The Chinese were absolutely belligerent, aggressive, abusive. They hark back to the 1962 war, promised to defend territorial sovereignty at all costs. Then, as usual, they put out visual drills of fire, of love fire drills of their formations in Tibet, saying that they are militarily much stronger than you. Accused New Delhi of hegemonic diplomacy in the sense that we were intervening on behalf of a sovereign country and therefore getting Bhutan to behave the way that we want. And then one of the, and this was put out by an official Xinhua. Uh, agency called the Seven Sins Video. I, I suggest that you have a look at it if you haven't, it's on YouTube, where they make their point about the Doklam issue. So while, in, while India was calm, balanced, and trying to resolve this issue, China was completely aggressive. So there was a totally different its tone, the way that it made statements, it says that you have forgotten 1962, we'll give you another lesson, and now so on. It was on and on. Of course, it was Global Times and the rest of it. And so even the Chinese foreign ministry was aggressive, including their foreign minister, their ambassador uh, in, in Delhi. Finally, of course, diplomacy triumphed and a compromise was made, finally worked out. And that compromise is reflected by statements given by both countries on 28th of August, 2017. India said, in recent weeks, India and China have maintained diplomatic communication in respect to the incident at Doklam. During these communications, we were able to express our views and convey our concerns and interests. On this basis, Disengagement of border personnel at the face-off site at Doklam has been agreed to and is ongoing. So what was the basis? They said they will disengage. On the basis, what India said is, of our views and our concerns and our interests. What did China say? China put out a different type of statement altogether. The Chinese side has made it clear that the Indian border personnel and equipment that trespassed into Chinese territory have all been withdrawn to the Indian side of the border. This was factual. In the sense that they were withdrawn. The Chinese border troops continue with their patrols and stationing in the Donglang area, which is what they call Dokala. China will continue with its exercise of sovereign rights to protect territorial sovereignty in accordance with the stipulations of the border related historical treaty. That's the 1890 treaty. So there was an agreement to disengage, but there was no other agreement. And at that agreement, obviously, just it was about getting rid of the face off, not solving the problem. Because obviously, on both sides, there was, and Chinese were much more interested probably uh, in making sure that this got done before the BRICS conference was done. So you see, there is a different tone in what China says, that 
Donglam belongs to us. We will continue to do what you want. You guys have gone back and we are very happy with it. So that's what it is. The Indians say that we have shown our interest and we have come back. Okay. So this is where the compromise was. Now, this is Doklam 2.0 and let me introduce you to it. And the person who actually brought this into the Indian limelight is there on our webinar. His name is Colonel Vinayak, but he actually is a former military intelligence uh, officer who is now actually affiliated to the print. And so Doklam 2.0 was revealed by him, and I'll come to the timeline a little later, in 2018 March. And this is what it looks like. Go, let's go first to start from the left is the A is the older camp, which is A. And you see these roads, there are helipads they built. They were all built after the, the Doklam 1-0 crisis. Then some of these roads already existed. It's not that the roads were built, but what we're saying is they're helipads. Then there is a tank transporter, which means it's the one which carry heavy vehicle, whether it's a tank transporter or anything else, is a, could be disputed by the fact is that you, you, know, you, go, you need these vehicles also to carry bulldozers and so on. Then, of course, it made some new roads, linked them up. Again, another group of tank transporters. I'll give you a detailed slide of this later. And here are some mechanized vehicles. And the road from there, and they made an absolutely new road which goes from north here, and this is a helipad here, this is the new road. And it goes about 750 meters to 800 meters short of the Torsa Nala. All this in disputed territory between Bhutan and China. This, apparently, you can't do so much of preparations here unless you have time on your side. So this would have been done sometime after the BRICS meeting is over in September, October, November, December, January period, or maybe February also. And it would be most unlikely that the India government was not aware of these deployment and construction of the new roads. Surely they would have kept the area under observation, used our own satellite resources. And though this, this part cannot be seen from Dokala by our troops, the Bhutanese from Jamferi Ridge can see it. So the Indian government probably must have known this. I think I would think they would have already known this by October. But it has been kept under wraps. And the situation now is that it remains there because the roads have been constructed. And I'll show you the next slide, which is Vinayak Bhatt's slide. And we have given him, which gives you where the point A, and point A, let me go back, is here. This is the older portion, OK? This is where, where Doklam 1-0 took place. This is the Indian forward trenches, concrete structure within Opita, small vehicles, PLA tents and structures, foot tracks, point of conflict. So this is what is there. And if you see down below, 12 October 2017, that's the date line of the satellite photo. Now come to B, lower down. Here, and, and, and B is, Sorry. This is where B is. B is actually towards the rear of, you can say, Doklam 1.0. It is towards the rear. And here it is. The deployment looks like they have brought some mechanized vehicles, the new road construction. There is tank transporters, which is what will carry heavy vehicles. Uh, bulldozers and so on could be used for carrying tanks but I really don't think that they would have brought these tanks up here because they can't do much from there. Anyway, so C, and this is 
Doklam 2.0. Let me tell you where it is again. This is where C is. This is the area. Here, a whole lot of stuff you can see. There are there are howitzers positions, which howitzers are motors actually of a slightly long range. There are new roads. There's tank transporters. There's PLA tents. There is B vehicles. So, both towards in the west in Doklam 1.0 and towards the east in Doklam 2.0, the Chinese have physically occupied it, militarily constructed more roads. That's the evidence which we get from satellite photographs. So this is just a Takshashila map, which I want to tell you to put, put things in perspective. Just follow my arrow. This is where Doklam 1.0 took place. This is Doklam 2.0. This is the Torsa Nala. Remember this road was heading for the Torsa Nala. And Torsa Nala, and, and it could actually go we can bypass it a little and go towards the Jamferi Ridge. So this is where the new road is. It's not as broad as it's made out of way, just to show you. And this is what Doklan 2.0 is about. So Doklan 2.0 cannot again be seen from here, can be seen from the Jamferi Ridge, can be surely be seen from satellite photograph. If the, a satellite photograph of October showed it, which means that they immediately, soon after September, they had started their deployment and constructed the road. So just remember that but as we go forward. Okay, so let's see what reactions to Doklam 2.0 has been. It was first revealed by the print on 17th January, which focused primarily on construction and activity in Doklam 1.0. And it actually had a vintage of, I think, a December uh, satellite photograph. Soon after that, on 18 January, the MEA spokesman made a statement. He said, and this is probably because of a question which asked, the government would once again reiterate that the status quo at the face-off site has not been altered. Any suggestions to the contrary is inaccurate and mischievous. So what he said was the truth, and it is very well crafted because at the state, as the Doklam standoff site, this statement is true, but it is not true for the general area where other things were happening. So on the 6th of March, the defense minister made the following statement. PLA has undertaken construction of some infrastructure including sentry posts, trenches, and helipads. Troops of both sides have redeployed themselves away from their respective position at the face-off site. The strength of both sides has been reduced. So all this is correct if you just talk about the face-off site. So in that context, the defense minister has grudgingly admitted that some new things have happened. Helipads have come up, some sentry posts and trenches, and some infrastructure, including Trinity Post Center. So there is a, what do you call a half acceptance to the fact that there is, but all this is to related to, to actually referring to only Doklam 1.0. Then on 17th of March, at the Raisina Dialogue, the Chief of Army Staff was asked a question, and this is what he said. They have carried out some infrastructure development. Most of it is temporary in nature. But while the troops may have returned and the infrastructure remains, it is anybody's guess whether they would come back there or it is because of the winter they could not take their equipment away. So again, this is about, it's not about admitting 2.0, it's about what is happening at the face off site. It looks like they, they are there, they haven't taken their equipment, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Then, on 19th March, Colonel Vinayak Bhatt, who is a participant in this webinar, reveals the, the photo earlier, 
in which he says that there a new road has been built, there are helipads there, that's short of Torsa Nala, and that is what was revealed by him on 19th of March. Now, there is the, the, the rest of the Indian media is, you can say, mostly muted, passes it by, and it remains where it is with, known to very few people. But on 23rd of March, Gautam Bambewala, our ambassador in China, made the statement. A key lesson from last year's standoff is that if anyone changes the status quo, it will lead to a situation like what happened in Doklam. Of course, he didn't talk about Doklam 2.0. And the Chinese counter to that statement on 26th of March is revealing. China says, Doklam belongs to China because we have historical conventions. China's activities there are within our sovereign rights. There is no such thing as changing status quo. Last year, thanks to our concerted efforts and our wisdom, we properly resolved the issue. We hope the Indian side could learn some lessons from this and stick to the historical conventions and work with China towards peace. So that was China's reaction to the ambassador's statement. And what was the other reactions? Bhutan has been silent, not a word about 2.0. Our media, as I said, has been reticent. The Indian parliament is not informed, nor is the public informed. So this is what was the Indian government's reaction to Doklam 2.0. Basically, don't play it up. Don't even reveal it to anybody. Don't even tell the Chinese or complain to the Chinese about it. So this is where our reaction was. Okay, now to understand the reaction, I think we need to look at the evidence of what is in the larger, much larger time space. Because before this happened, there are other things which had happened. And let's start with September 17, when Xiamen sidelined talks took place between Prime Minister Modi and Xi. And apparently they decided that we need to improve our relations, primarily because both were under the erratic impact of Trump's policy. And so they probably had, uh, it was uh, that the, we need to actually improve our relations. That's what the basic idea was, because Today, the MEA spokesman in later statement says that it is a Xi'an we first made the, and that was September. But in October 17, uh, October 17 is the 19th CPC. That's where she gains more power. A Lo lot of things, one, it becomes the dictator of a, of a size far larger than Mao or Deng. And then on 22nd, of December, there is the 20th round of boundary talks between Yang Jiechi, who is the interlocutor from the Chinese side, the special representative, and our own NSA, Ajit Dover. At the end of the talks, they say that we need to resolve our differences slightly, uh, very anodyne statements, which normally have accompanied most of these talks, but doesn't, didn't, it doesn't seem to have made any progress except they will continue to talk. I mean, that's the statement. Then, between December and 22nd of February, things start changing. It starts with a foreign secretary's note to the cabinet secretary on Tibetan Thanksgiving event shift from Delhi to Dharmasala. And apparently that letter in which it was this thing was leaked to the press. It is unusual. And otherwise it could never have found its way there, but it was leaked. So it became a public document. And apparently done deliberately. I, I mean, one can only surmise. I don't think so. At the same time, the Foreign Secretary sent another note to the Institute of Different Studies and Analysis withdrawing political clearance for a conference which was to be held 
in the first week of March on Sino-Indian relations. I'm a member of the Executive Council of the IDSA. And when I asked for what is the reason for it, I, my, the initial reply was that the DG himself has not been able to find out, but the fact is that the political clearance was withdrawn. There were a whole lot of speakers coming there from all over the world, and it was abruptly canceled for administrative reasons. I mean, now that, of course, was obvious. Then, next day, Foreign Secretary goes to Beijing. He has talks there, meets all the important people, returns. And on 8 March, following a parliamentary session, Wang Yi, who is now the foreign minister, makes this statement. Chinese and Indian leaders have developed a strategic vision for future of our relations. The Chinese dragon and the Indian elephant must not fight each other, but dance with each other, he said. If China and India are united, one plus one will become 11 instead of two. So this was the Chinese way of telling the world that China and telling India also that we need to improve our relationship. And of course, that statement met with a very positive reception from the Indian Foreign Ministry who welcomed the statement and actually said that the good relations between two countries also has a global significance and as two major countries and large economies, relations between India and China are just important bilaterally, but also have a regional and global significance. So this was a statement which came off the Chinese foreign minister's elephant and dra uh, dragon dance. And then followed up 10 days later by Song Tao who visited Delhi. Now, who is Song Tao? Song Tao is a chief of the international relations departments of the Chinese Communist Party. Remember that the, that the Chinese foreign minister is part of the foreign estab uh, uh, ministry establishment. Here is the Chinese Communist Party. And Chinese Communist Party is obviously the most important party. As chief of the party's foreign policy department, Song Tao holds a very important place, particularly given his closeness to President Xi Jinping. <laughs> so you can see that he visited India, had talks again, and there again it was positive, made good statements, must improve relations, and it carried on like that. Okay, so this was followed again by a Chinese commerce and trade delegation to Delhi because economic, obviously, opening up the economy, tying it closer, opening up the markets and so on were discussed. So they, this was another delegation. On 27th of March, China agreed to share data on the Brahmaputra suspended during Doklam 1.0. I put it in red because if any concession the Chinese gave us, and actually it was no concession because this was part of an agreement which they had violated, now they are being, becoming large-hearted and saying that, okay, we'll give it to you. This, probably you can treat it as a concession, but I would think it is not. On 30th of April, our National Security Advisor met Wang Jie Chi, who is the Special Interlocutor on Border uh, Talks in Shanghai, not in Beijing, because he was returning from, Wang was returning from somewhere else. And there was this ugly movement with the MEA, because the MEA was briefing, and when somebody asked him, where is the NSA in China, the MEA actually, uh, spokesman at that point of time did not know that the NSA was in China. So it was a very awkward moment for the foreign ministry. On 23rd of April, there are visits of, because the SCO is now scheduled by the Minister of External Affairs and the Defense Minister for the Shanghai Cooperation. Here the Defense Minister says that we'll take part in military exercises as part of SCO where even Pakistan was involved, and you know this, but that's no big deal. On 25th of April, media reports, and this is media report, that India is going to restart bilateral exercises with China. 
we've been having this bilateral exercise really for quite some time. I was privileged to be part of the first bilateral exercise held in Kunming. I think it was in 2007, maybe two, maybe 2007 or 2008. Uh, 25th of April, media reports, uh, again, a restart. And then, of course, is the unofficial Wuhan summit, and where they agree to an increased engagement in deepening economic cooperation, possibility of working on joint products and projects, and in fact, one of that was supposed to be in Afghanistan. Then they said that they will give strategic guidance to the militaries, although one wonders whether the strategic guidance did not already yeah, already be there because we have an agreement with them. We know exactly where SOP is, how face-offs are to be handled, what to do when you come and face-to-face -face with each other. They actually open up and tell them, this is Indian territory, you go back. They open up and say, this is Chinese territory, you go back. And this goes on and then finally people will draw to where they come. So the, the, the basic thing is by the month of October, Indians knew about Doklam 2.0 that the Chinese have deployed and they've also constructed a road. When that was known to the Indians and all this has just taken part with that in mind. Okay, just keep that in. in. So, and the last point which I've put there in blue is post Wuhan, Australia excluded from exercise Malabar. Why do we say excluded? Because in the early part of the year, the Australian prime minister said that we are in talks with India to be incorporated in Malabar. But soon after Wuhan, it became very clear that India is not going to invite Australia to Malabar. Now, Malabar is an exercise which takes place between India and the US. It had Japan in it. And if Australia had come into it, it probably would represent some sort of a quad in being. So what I have, I have put in blue is what is the concessions which probably in and, and the first two are very clear and even the third one is clear is what India has made to China. What we have so far got in return is that they agreed to share data on the Brahmaputra and of course promises that we must improve our relations and not go the way that Dokta does. I'm not saying that we should not have peace with China, but I, I'm, I'm saying that the terms of India's engagement with China has changed. It's, it's obvious from this slide that India has now realized that this guy has got too much of power, that we know we need to actually reset our relationship. And even if we give away here and there, it should be in the larger cost we justify it. But we'll get to that. But let me just go to the next one. So what are the implications? This is the evidence. As far as India-Bhutan relations are concerned, the major brunt of this is with Bhutan. Because so far we have been saying, and we said in Doklam 1, that we cannot, and, this way, and India has stood up to China. But when Doklam 2.0 happened, and it actually has the same implications, India has fallen silent. It's not only fallen silent, not complained to them. It is also kept it's parliament and public out of uh, uninformed. So the potential major wedge is in Indo-Bhutan relations because Bhutanese, as far as the Bhutanese are concerned, they realize they're so small that they can be eaten up by China. And that is why they've always been that India would be of some help in solving this problem. So with the, with the Bhutanese also, apparently we must have we, we, I presume the Bhutanese must have told up, now it's enough, no, please don't create another problem, just remain quiet, let it be, we don't want to it, let them take it, or something like that. Because generally that has been the Bhutanese leadership's attitude, because to them it really doesn't matter, it mattered to us. But what we can do is, is to drive a wedge in Indo-Bhutanese relations. That Bhutan in course of time can slip out of India's influence I wouldn't say that geography would allow it completely, but China's influence in Bhutan could be expected to grow and India would not be able to do anything about it. That is the major geopolitical point. Internationally, of course, India could be seen as succumbing to China's pressure tactics. 
But here it is, there's something happened. Even now, uh, press report just referred to Doklam, some new constructions have come there. But since it has been muted, there's not much reference to it. But in course of time, you cannot conceal this. And the message would be that here is another country which is actually again succumbed to China's special values. Like the rest of the, uh, the Southeast Asia would really <laughs> be proof of that. Third, India's neighbors could also imbibe the lesson that India is not willing to stand up to Chinese aggression of Bhutanese territory. In spite of the fact that we have a pact with them, but there would be reasons for it in statecraft. But the fact is that as far as the Chinese are concerned, their lesson would be those guys are too strong. The Indians are, can do nothing much. We better look after ourselves and do what the Chinese tell us. I mean, that would be the larger lesson they get. And that's in, 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 in political and strategic terms is a very large negative for India. But it's already happening. You can say that it's already happening. So this one actually just adds on to it. China's aggressive and vitriolic statements during Doklam 1.0 may have influenced India's leadership to change attitudes to China due to perceived military vulnerabilities on the northern border. This statement must be taken with a pinch of salt, but I, I'll put it here because it is very clear to us that we had at some point in time after Doklam changed our mind about taking, you can say, standing up to China. And we said we must reset our relationship. And Doklam 1.0, Chinese were very aggressive. And so I think it is possible that the political leadership has been impacted by that aggressiveness and therefore influence its political and strategic behavior. But this is only a supposition. It can never be proved. But I would think that if you look at the timeline of events, there would be more than a grain of truth in this statement. Fifth, India's silence indicates a strategic cover-up. Silence of media and uninformed parliament and public reflects lack of transparency on Indian democracy. Here is when we made Doklam 1.0, we made such this thing, we called it a victory. We stood up to China. We defended Bhutan's interests on our own. The same thing happens a little couple of kilometers away. Then we are quiet. So we have two different patches of behavior. One we show that we are standing up. The other we show that we are, we are going to actually live with it. So this is the implication. So what the adopted option is, of course, keep quiet. Do not raise the issue because the larger thing is about trying to actually sort out the problem between two global giants who are at, who are at each other's necks. How does India navigate between the two? So there is a much larger geopolitical question there. And finally, we have a quiz to Chinese aggression and discriminatory with Bhutan. This is a fact. And there is enough of evidence to take, to suggest that this is an adopted motion because all that we have done with the Chinese is with the knowledge that the Chinese have violated an indo bhutanese agreement, violated an, an understanding with us, and we have not raised our voice. So what options did we have? Maybe we could have asked Bhutan to protest, but considering Bhutan's position, it's this thing the Bhutanese really this time would have been quite clear in your mind to let it be. We can't, don't, 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 don't just make it worse. I suppose that would have been the case. But India, which is not to be known as a military power of any consequence, has a political voice of consequence and led by a prime minister whose eloquence and voices were, were known in a global level. We did not but what we could have done, and that's an option, and we can discuss that, but at least raised it. We could have done it in two ways. Just spoke about Bhutan, the, the, the Chinese takeover of disputed Bhutan territory by force, which is a violation of international norms. 
and the UN Charter, or we could have taken up the larger case of what China's predatory behavior has been in disputed territories in East Asia, South, Asia, South China, and Bhutan. India should, could have voiced it as being the leader of the voice to protest because nobody is protesting. The Chinese are having their way without being contested. The United States has primarily treated the Southeast Asian issue largely by sending in these, what do you call, patrols, phone ops. And then Lenny said that, okay, this is bilateral. Let this be sorted out between the two. Can we take a similar posture with Bhutan? That this is bilateral? And is that change of posture worth what we are going to get from China? These are questions which only the future can answer. But we need to watch this space and see as to what it gains for us and what, it, what losses for us. Because that will only be told in terms of time. And we simply do not know how short or long that is going to be. So with that, I come to the end of Doklam 2.0. Now you can shoot the general and you can shoot the historian. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you, General. So we still have some time before I conclude. So if you have any other questions, then please raise your hands on YouTube and we can discuss. Rakesh. Okay. Go ahead, Rakesh. Hi, General. Hi, Anirudh. Hi. My question was, um, so I saw, I see Doklam, Doklam 1.0 as a significant win for uh, India, especially as far as prestige goes throughout the world. So do you think that, that India got enough feedback from Doklam 1.0 that it risked giving it all away at Do Doklam 2.0? Was India's profile in the world, uh, uh, was it, uh, what, did it make an impact? Yeah, actually, you know, the issues are the power of the narrative. And I think in, on those terms, India largely over the people thing looked at it, people looked at it that here is India standing up to China. That's the narrative which probably uh, emerged from it, how it was given. And, but as far as we were concerned, the compromise which we, this thing, did not change anything. The Chinese were able to do what they wanted to do after the compromise. And therefore, and that of course is not known to many. So as far as the original narrative is concerned, I presume that it still endures. So we'll have to see how long that, that it endures. That's what the point is. Thank you. Dipanka. Dipanka, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I have two questions. Is you know this whole incident uh, which you talked about? You know, first thanks uh, for thriller at least to me. Most of his uh, the recent past was unknown to me. Now I have two questions. One is what has been the precedence of Indian government? Uh, over the years, like this, uh, in uh, divulging the details to the public in general, uh, because I'm sure similar situation has arisen. But deeper, I think, but there's a problem with the audio. But I think uh, I don't see you. Is that uh, uh, is there? With the Doklam 2.0, uh, is Dipanka, I've got your question, I, uh, uh, but your, uh, there's something problem with the audio. I can't hear you, but I have understood your question. Of course, governments all over the world. I have another question. Uh, Dipanka, do you mind putting it up on chat and then I'll read it out since you seem to have some audio issues? Okay, I, I've answered, I'll just answer this question. I mean, do governments lie? 
is what Deepak is asking. Of course they do. World over they do. They actually, uh, in fact, there is an interesting book by John Mashmeyer, the uh, American political scientist, who actually has a book by the name of Why Governments Lie. And he's classified these lies and they do it for good causes, for bad causes, to protect their own, to protect the country. And sometimes they keep it away from the people because it is, they think it is good for them. So governments do this very often. And uh, I, I must say, even the Indian government probably doesn't divulge fully what ha actually happens because also there is an issue of, of uh, secrecy, especially if it's a standoff and there are military things which you would not like to put in the public domain. So that's, that's pretty, pretty normal. But, but the fact is, from Doklam 1.0, where we went in, uh, this thing, our reaction here has been different. So what we have done is the government has known they kept it away from everybody else. So whether it's good or bad, only time shall tell. Pranav. Go ahead, Pranav. Um, hello? Yeah, Pranav, go ahead. Uh, so my question is, does India have a clear strategy of how it wants to approach China? Are we having an imbalance? For example, in the uh, recent unofficial meetings, while well, India, we hailed it as a historic event. Uh, the Chinese were actually quite muted. Uh, the story didn't even make it to the front page of the newspapers. So do we have a strategy or are we going by whatever we get? Suppose we have, suppose we have an opportunity to engage with China. We say, okay, we'll reset. India China reset. And however, with the United States, we announce a quad, and however, we do not keep up with these promises. Uh, do we have a clear strategy in mind, or are we in what some people call it as Modi's speed dating policy? I think I will leave to, to judge the evidence is quite indication of the fact that we probably don't have one. We are still grasping with one. And as you know, they made a defense planning committee which one of the tasks given to it, which is headed by the NSA, is to make a national security strategy. But the fact that we have been vacillating from being tilting towards the US sometimes, then we want to come back, then we talk about going back to research with China, is obviously there's a lot of muddle there. Is what is, we are, we are outsiders. We do not know how the thinking inside is. And let me tell you, those people are very capable but from the outside, it looks very mumbled, is all I can say. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Pranav. Uh, Kirisha, I am unmuting you. Go ahead, Kirisha. Yeah. So, my question was you stated the. Loudly, loudly. Yeah, you stated the uh, adopted position, position by India and also the options that we had. But were there really options? Had it had in, India, could, could India really have uh, taken up the South Asian uh, aggression by China to in the international arena at all? Was it really possible? I mean, already India and China are having a very delicate and fragile relation. Would, wouldn't it have... Uh, made it worse and uh, it would have been uh, put them in, into a direct conflict with each other. Yeah, actually your question itself is reflective of the problem. The moment you let a bully do what he wants and everybody keeps silent, the bully keeps bullying everybody else more and more. India could be that international voice. It is, if you look at Indian history, it has been when actually it is blatant violation of international norms. So it would have been a voice which we would have, we would have been the leader of that voice and we would have got a lot of international support. It would have had its cost with our relations with China. That is for certain. So we are worried about the cost and therefore we are silent. Therefore, what is going to show is that we are no longer on equal or at any term the same table as China. China will eat up everybody else. And as the saying goes, we are on the menu, not on the table. So we are not talking on, on, on equal terms with China, with China. But remember, India is not a pushover power. Our political power comes from the fact is that we have got a size and we have the, the, the power level where India's shift either towards the US 
or towards China or remaining neutral makes a lot of difference. That is the political power that India has. It must use that political power wisely. It is not easy. It is a challenge to statecraft. But if you think that we will remain, we should remain quiet when we have a treaty with another nation, there is aggression. And even in Southeast Asia, we should not raise it, not because of anything else, because of violation of international norms. Because the fact is, we are just trying to say that there should be justice on this account. The bully cannot be allowed to have his way. India could have been the voice, but it would have had costs. The political leadership were not willing to take those costs, so they've gone silent. That is a matter for debate. Only time will tell whether this was a good deal or not. Neil. Sir, sir, my question was more from actual what could we have done in uh, Doklam 2.0 given the fact that we are in the Jamperi Ridge, uh, we, are, we are on um, Gyomachan uh, La and on uh, Doka La and the fact that the area which was shown in the map by you sir was uh, I assume at a distance of um, around 2-3 to three kilometers if I am not wrong. That's right. From the, Yes, from that point on did we really have an option of doing what we did next to Doklam, which was just around um, a few hundred meters to actually crossing men, material, logistics and going that far, was it really a practicable point, number one? And number two, sir, uh, our position on matters such as this, it's not that it has happened only in Bhutan, it has happened in POK as well. It, and we follow the same, same, same policy there. I mean, this policy of silence, so to say. So why should it be different here, especially in light of uh, the fact that Bhutan itself is not doing anything? While we have a pact, as long as Bhutan is not complaining, do you think we have the right to really, uni in this case, it would be more or less unilateral rather than, uh, you know, coming in aid of Bhutan, since Bhutan is not complaining at all? Did yeah, we okay. have that option? Uh, we are running short of time. So, uh, uh, I hope you can, uh, you can answer post questions in short time. Your first thing. There's nothing militarily which you could have done. I have not even suggested that that is never an option. It is only politically you have got to do something. That's point one. The fact that you have Bhutan, we are the, the only nation with we have the closest of relationship. And I agree with you that the Bhutan themselves, in fact, Bhutan themselves were unhappy about the Doklam 1.0. Okay. So uh, the point yes. was Bhutan's attitude towards Doklam has always been, Ki, why don't you allow us to give it to them and settle with China? Okay. But we have held our ground on that. Now we have changed our ground. So that's a different matter. The fact is whether we are, when you have acquiesced to Chinese aggression, when they know you know it, and yet you're keeping quiet, then the Chinese are taking a lesson out of it and they'll now treat you as a, a person who can actually be a subservient, a supplicant. And that I'm afraid is not what India should be. Vinayak, last question. Agreed, sir. I just wanted to add a little bit. Yeah. Concessions. One second. Um, yeah. Colonel Bhatt? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I can hear him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I'll come back again. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for this wonderful uh, webinar. I was just uh, trying to add uh, a little bit on what the concessions uh, you talked about. China sharing the data. Actually, China has agreed to share this data of Brahmaputra River on a payment of 80 lakh rupees per year. That is the kind of payment we are making and still they do not uh, give the data. That is the status as of date. Okay. And the Indian parliament, of course, uh, most of the politicians are reading onto the newspapers. Whenever it uh, came out in the print, most of them uh, must have read it. I have also gone in front of the uh, MEA standing committee and uh, deposed whatever my evidence was and that has been uh, given to them. So, uh, I just wanted to add these two points okay. and I also would like to uh, reply uh, two questions, sir. Somebody yeah, asked about the word, how did it you know, perceive uh, India as, India was of course uh, perceived as uh, a good, uh, uh, you know, we took a very good stand and uh, stood by the, uh, stood against the bully. And that is what uh, everybody uh, perceived uh, India as, except Australia. 
when uh, Modi and Xi met, that was the time when Australia, uh, some uh, newspaper in Australia said that India had blinked. You know, that was the only aberration uh, from the thing. And uh, I think Pranab asked uh, one of the questions, if the story of uh, this uh, Modi and Xi meeting came on the front page of the newspapers in China, it did on the Ranmin uh, uh, newspaper, uh, which is the most important newspaper of China. It came on two days on the front page. You can see it for yourself. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, so thank you everybody. We have run out of time. And uh, uh, our idea was to state the evidence and try to see what is the logic behind it. Frankly, from the outside, it is very difficult to know the inner logic. But certain things are very clear. That India's silence is the cost that we are going to bear for what we think China is going to give us. So far, they've given us very little. And as Vinayak said, it's about 80 lakhs and whatever the data is supposed to be, nothing else is been forthcoming. So we'll have to watch the space. It's too early to jump to conclusions. And thank you very much, for all of you, for being here to listen to an old man speak. Good night.